Anyway, uh, today I've got a, a pretty exciting guest I'm really happy to have on. I've got uh, uh, retired uh, New York uh, NYPD police detective uh, Jim Rothstein on. Jim, hello. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on, Mike. Hey, well, it's my pleasure. Um, you know, you, you come highly regarded from every source I've, I've mentioned. You know, you and I have spoken on the phone only once before. But um, I want you to, to, to open up by you know, telling us, you know, who are you, where do you come from, and what did you do for the NYPD for all those years? Well, first of all, I was born and raised in central Minnesota, and I joined the United States Navy. And after I got out of the Navy, I ended up in New York City. First, I went to work for Chase Manhattan Bank, and then I ended up taking the test for the New York Police Department, and I scored probably the only time I ever scored good on a test, and uh, I got appointed right after that. Went through training boot camp, or the academy as they called it, and then I was assigned to Times Square, and it was the rudest way to wake up in the middle of New York is in Times Square as a cop in uniform, uh, and my first assignment was 42nd Street and 8th Avenue, and from there on, uh, I ended up making detective, but in the meantime, I had started working prostitution, vice, and those related things, and that took me into a very strange world, and which led me into many of these investigations that I did into human trafficking, human compromise, and that type of thing, corruption, uh, everything else you can imagine that goes with it. And that's a, a quick thing. And then one day I went to work and I was retired. And like every good detective in New York, you open up a bar and restaurant. And I stayed there for a while, got that going. It was a very busy place. And then I moved to Maine for a couple of years, and finally I ended back up here in Minnesota. Well, I'm, I'm sure it always feels good to come back home to Minnesota, but, you know, what we what we agreed to talk about today was human trafficking and uh, the art of human compromise is used by organized crime. So I want to I open up with that. I mean, tell us about this human trafficking issue, because we all hear about it. I'm talking about more than just illegal aliens. I'm talking about everything across the board, the good, the bad, and the ugly, from white slavery to child prostitution, uh, the, the, the whole gamut. You know, So let, let's start there. Well, human trafficking is far more than just using people. There are so many things that go with it and so many different versions of it. You have human trafficking for labor. You have human trafficking for everything. We ran across all of it, but most of all, we got into the use of children and humans for traffic, both girls and boys. When we got into the girls, uh, it was, you know, it was the first time it had been done, and the police department assigned me as the guy to do it. And soon after I got on there, I saved the life of a girl, uh, the pimps. She was going to be forced, like all girls were, to go with the pimp. And she didn't want to go with a pimp, so they threatened to kill her. And when they showed up, we arrested the pimp. So I had I found out that there was more to prostitution than just girls out there selling their bodies. And that's where I first ran into human compromise. I found that this girl had information on a lot of other things that were happening. And eventually she started a high echelon. She became a high echelon uh, operative with a bunch of girls working, and uh, which gave me a good source of information. And as this went along, more and more of the girls started trusting me, and the more and more information came along. I started getting information on drug operations and anything and everything you could imagine. And finally, we got into the pedophile, the little boy stuff, and that's where the real human compromise really comes in. You would be amazed how many people in this country, both in business, our government, the military, have been compromised. And the latest one now, as you're seeing, is the women who have been compromised in the military, not compromised, but used. And the one thing that I've been talking about lately, and I go back on this, back to one of my informants, Skull Murphy, 
who actually had compromised admirals, generals, and everybody else. And since he was my informant, I had access to that information. But now, like you have in the military, uh, and we just had a couple cases lately here, uh, you have to remember, if a high-ranking officer has sex with a subordinate, and there's a guy like me around and gets wind of it, he's got him compromised. And I'll say the wrong type of person gets this who has ulterior motives, such as breaching our national security. You know, they're talking about Snowden leaking information. Can you imagine if you have a guy on the inside, he's compromised, and you squeeze him for information? So that was how the human compromise investigation started. And like I said, it took us to the highest levels. Another one where you have to look at human compromise was the Watergate break-in. In the Watergate break-in, everybody probably has heard that there was a prostitution ring operating out of the Democratic National Headquarters. Yes, but everybody just assumed it was female prostitutes. No, there was a pedophile operation going there. And in these operations, we had found out that there are books, as we call them, or things where they keep a record of the customer, what his fetish is, how much he pays, and that type of thing. So can you imagine the person that gets a hold of this, the, the type of compromise he can get going? There's one other th interesting thing, and it's just been in a book called Watergate Exposed. Uh, and I knew at the time because I worked with my counterpart, Carl Schaffler, in Washington, D.C., and the Watergate break-in, they knew that break-in was going to happen long before it ever happened. So there's many much disinformation out there, but the whole purpose of it was human compromise. So that just touches on a few of the things, and uh, I think that will give us a good start here. I, I think it does. and I, I think we need to, to lay down what the, back, the background is here. I mean, you, you might have a, um, a general. You might have a congressman. You might have a judge uh, who has partake partaken as a pedophile with a young boy or uh, or with an underage girl, and you you look at these things, and if so, this is something that will crush anyone's career, and so the, once once they've got that information, they're they're really becoming an, an owned asset. They they become chattel property of whoever has that knowledge, so that they can. Oh. Uh, they, 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 they will do anything and everything to make sure that their secret case stays see, uh, a secret from the public. That's very true. And as I went along, <clears throat> and we, like they used to say, to find an honest cop with integrity is very rare. And once I had established that, and a couple of the guys I worked with, we had people come to us, and many times, we were fed information, just using human compromise, where somebody needed something or wanted to stop something, and they feed us the information. So uh, it was quite easy to get the inside track. Okay, well, Jim, we're coming up to our first commercial break here, so hang on. We'll be right back in a couple of minutes. More with retired detective Jim Rothstein. Stick with us, folks. Be right back. Today is Wednesday, July 10th, 2013, and my guest today is retired NYPD Detective Jim Rothstein. Jim, welcome back to the show. Thank you. Well, I, I want to ask you a question because um, I remember about 20 years ago, 15 years ago, some time back when it was revealed that homosexual representative Barney Frank of Massachusetts, that his live-in lover was running a, a gay prostitution ring out of, out of the congressman's home. Um, you know, so it, it makes me wonder, it, it's pretty obvious to me that Barney Frank was compromised or could have been compromised, but how many other congressmen and senators and things? And, you know, I want people to realize that, you know, um, during the Cold War, the Soviet Union was famous for setting up things called honey traps, uh, where they'd uh, try to get some official, you know, general uh, intelligence asset, uh, uh, elected official, whatever, involved with uh, some young, attractive, you know, woman or, or in some cases, man, and uh, they they would blackmail him. But they're not the only ones doing this. So why don't we talk about those things for a moment? Well, certainly, and that definitely. Uh, happened, but that was a very small part of it. And if you look at it now, 
you'd be amazed how many people are compromised in our in our political world and that. But go beyond that. Uh, what about businesses? I had one instance where one of the big companies in this United States was being totally extorted by human compromise, where they had set up some officials in this company and were just cleaning house with them. Not only that, they were, were able to get secrets, and it was a medical uh, company. Uh, they were give, able to steal some of the best secrets in the world from them. So it went across everything. It was in sports. It was everywhere. And it's by, like right now with the uh, electronic media and that, it has so, become so much easier to do that because these people go on and actually uh, correspond back and forth on the Internet and whatever else you want to call it. Well, that, that that that's a good point, but let's let's go let's just go backward a step here. You know, I, I look at the policy decisions of the U.S. government. Some of the things we've done that just don't pass the common sense test to me. You know, I look at all the failed policies of the, of the past. I, I look at let's start with Obamacare. You know, seventy plus percent, seventy two percent of the U.S. population was opposed to Obamacare. They didn't want it. But yet we got it shoved down our throats anyway, and those who resisted had their arms twisted. Uh, you know, you you had the uh, the corn husker, uh, what do they call that uh, that that deal where they they you gave a whole bunch of extra perks and uh, spending yep. programs yep. to to Nebraska and all that kind of stuff. All of this stuff goes on, and these things don't make sense to me. And and you watch business that does stuff that doesn't make sense. Why do they do these things? And, you know, maybe this sheds a little light on. It. Can you talk about that some? Why certainly. What is the easiest way to get somebody to follow along with what you want? You compromise them. And, uh, again, let me just give you an example. I like to give examples of cases that I actually work. There was some information I needed off the street about some criminal activity. And on this particular night on Lexington Avenue in Midtown, New York, uh, I met with a lieutenant with 13 of the best-looking uh, girls working the nightclubs and stuff in New York. And it was amazing. We were sitting there, and they were in various state of dress, getting ready to go out for the night to do their thing. And we told them what we needed. And those 13 girls went out, and it only took a day or two, and our answers came back. Now, if Say, for instance, you want to pass some legislation, and all of a sudden you're finding you don't have what you need, so you call in the favors. It, I wish I knew the exact number of uh, people who are compromised, but it's far more than anybody ever expected. What do you think is 50 percent, 10 percent, 80 percent? I had it at 35 percent. And uh, one of the people that I dealt with, an old informant of mine who just came out of the, well, he's been out a couple of years now, is a, a guy named Robert Merritt. And some people want to discredit him, but for many, many years uh, uh, I had been getting information, although I had never met him, but he was one of the people that was feeding me things. And he puts it at 70%, so that's his number. Mine is about 35%. If you have 35%, you've got a lot of power. Oh, well, yeah, you do, particularly if, let's say, on an ideological basis, you know, you have a, a difference between Democrats and Republicans. And um, you, you, let's, let's say it's, a, it's tight. You know, well, Let's say it's 52 in the Senate to 48, uh, uh, one party or the other. And, and if, you, if you can compromise 35% of the opposite party to get them to support something that they're ideologically opposed to, Boy, you can get a lot of stuff through you like. I mean, that that uh, you, you will not have any opposition to, and and you know that that's just, that's what amazes me. And you know, people need to be aware of this that how broken our government is. And and you know, the next question that that comes out is, what, what can we do? How do we fix this? You know, what what uh, what potential solutions do we have? Well, for instance, look at the situation. What was about a year and a half ago, where the Secret Service in Colombia got caught. Messing with prostitutes, the yeah. yeah. Okay, well, well, well we got, got to the break, Council. I want to ask you to hold your response just for a couple minutes. We'll be right back after this short break. Jim, welcome back. 
Before the break, you were going into an explanation. I asked how we could, well, what we can do to, to solve this, clean it up. And you were talking about the Secret Service agents in Colombia who uh, were involved with prostitutes down there. Yes, it is. And, you know, isn't anybody teaching these people the basics of when you're out there, especially on a detail like that where you're going to be uh, protecting our president or whatever it may be, and you go out and end up with one of these ladies, what if she happens to be an agent, which many, many of them are? Or she is a prostitute and she's working right or some detective or somebody out there who's, on, who's not actually looking to do something honorable, and they can compromise the whole situation. And this is where the problem comes in, and it, it goes way beyond that. But isn't anybody teaching them that this? Now, the other situation I just brought up is in the military. Now, I'm not against women being in the military, but didn't anybody ever hear about the birds and the bees and Mother Nature? You go and put young men and young women together, and there's a stressful situation, and you're in there. What is the most natural thing that's going to happen? They're going to be doing what? They're going to, it, it, there is nothing that stops that. Mother Nature is ever powerful. And this is the thing you've got to look at. If you create a situation and you have no way to control that type of thing, how are you going to stop this? And that's why you don't set up a condition like that. And in the case of the Secret Service, it's like when I was a police officer and I was setting this stuff up and working it, we had very tight control on the investigators who worked this to make sure we didn't get compromised. And there are some words that were used with that. Naturally, it was the street that I can't use on the air, but uh, they brought the point out, well, you don't do something where you eat. And, so you get you know what I'm saying, and this is why we got to look at this. The government's got to look at it, and somebody got to wake up. Well, do, do you know? I look at the whole changes in the military. It appears that the you know, like the rest of our society, the military is also subject to this social engineering project that I call cultural Marxism, and I I, I don't think that we need to have women in the military particularly in combat roles. I think that's absolutely nonsense. Uh, during World War II, the, the, the military was very segregated from the men's and women's functions that, that they were allowed to do. It was, they, you, were, you were kept deliberately at arm's length for a reason. And then you look at uh, what's going on now with gays in the military. And, uh, you know, there, there's been, you know, so far this year, there's been 10,700 Male uh, males have been raped in the military by other men, and you know I find this just to be beyond the pale. There, there is, there's no excuse for this. It shouldn't be tolerated. It isn't tolerated, but it, it it is in the name of this cultural Marxism called political correctness and this egalitarian view that everybody has these equal rights and should be allowed to serve. And I say no, it doesn't work. It's non-functional. Uh, well, it just it strikes me this this is set, it's being set up to fail and it's being set up to destroy our our culture, our society, and the military all from within. Yes, I agree one hundred percent. And what I call it is politically correct, feel good, do good, and it don't work. And this goes way back when we were working. Uh, we got into the subculture of this, and as you know, lately you've been hearing about the sexual revolution that has started with the Stonewall. Well, I was personally responsible for the Stonewall. And I remember when we did that and made that arrest, and there was only three people that ever knew the truth about that. And the thing was that it was a sexual revolution because what was going on at that time was horrendous. But at the time, there was part of the gay community that said, Jim, you know, this is good to help us and all that, but there are people that are going to take advantage of this. And just within the last year, one of the key leaders in this movement has come forward, and, he, you know, he called me and told me who he was because he's dying of cancer. So we were there. We saw what was coming, and nobody listened. Well, sorry about that, but my Skype uh, just turned itself off. So, Jim, I, I missed uh, part of uh, what you were saying there, you know, that you were personally responsible for the Stonewall. Could you, could you take that back and repeat it? But that, that's a highly unusual thing for Skype to shut itself down. 
uh, mid-interview because I, I do this every day, and it, th- th- this type of stuff hasn't happened to me in a long time. Well, it depends upon the subject you're discussing. It, it, it really is subject-dependent. I, I, I have to say that. And the more controversial <laughs> these subjects are, uh, the more chance it is that my uh, broadcast is going to be interfered with and or interrupted. So I apologize. Can we go back and, and you know, can you bring me up to speed what, what I missed while I was uh, logging back on? Well, the problem, you know, like I said, when the stone wall was, was going on there, there was a situation there. Uh, the gay underground, the homosexual underground, some of the people, like I said, my job was to find out what was going on in the uh, pedophilia and stuff like that. And the homosexual community at the time, uh, you know, it was not impossible. They were extorted. They were beaten, everything else. And uh, we really didn't feel that was right. But in the Stonewall, there was a situation, and this informant of mine was Ed Skull Murphy. And if everybody wants to, you look up an article written by William McGowan called Chickens and Bulls. And it described Skull Murphy. Well, one thing he didn't know when he wrote the article is that Skull was my informant. Skull had been one of the worst pedophiles I ever met in my life. He was a murderer, extortionist, human compromise. He personified what you could do with human compromise. But then he got religion, and he had been molested as a child. And then when I ran into him, he became one of the best, most valuable assets I had for finding out how this worked, but he was running the manager of the Stonewall at the time, and he was telling us about how the certain individuals in law enforcement were shaking the place down, in other words, getting paying bribes to stay open and that type of thing, and the mafia was extorting them, so, and we knew who the mafia people were, and we knew who the law enforcement people were. So we set up a thing to raid the place. So we waited till the payoff went down to law enforcement, and then we raided it. And just about four or five years ago, one of the people that was there stopped by to say hello because I'd saved his life, had been there that night, and the rally and cry was, go get them, girl. But that was the true story of why the raid at the Stonewall took place. And after they made the payoff, we went and raided it. And guess what? Skull Murphy never got arrested. He escaped, so nobody could ever figure that out. But that's the true story of what happened at the Stonewall, because there was a couple of honest cops who decided this was not going to be going on. Okay, well, Jim, we have another break coming up here, so we'll be right back in a couple of minutes. Folks, stick with us. Today, my guest is retired NYPD detective Jim Rothstein. Jim, welcome back. And Thank you. I've got a couple of questions, you know, because... During the time of the Stonewall, it was when a time when homosexuals hid their uh, their sexual orientation. They they were called in the closet, what it was called. And now we've got active promotion of this homosexual agenda. Do you have any insights as to what is behind it, who and why? Well, I touched on it a couple of minutes ago when I said that after the Stonewall, there was a these particular group that asked had asked for our help to stop this extortion and the beatings and stuff. And when they saw saw what the effect was, they said, you know, this pendulum is going to swing in another direction. And what's going to happen is is a a part of the society outside of our underground is going to jump on this. And as I said, I have the guy that, you know, I was there for these meetings where One of the goals that you see him striving for, and I called it the 50-year plan, was to slowly change the attitudes and eventually to allow pedophilia. And I firmly believe, and I mean, uh, we, we had the investigations, we did it, and we had infiltrated this. So, and if you look at what's happening, aren't we going in that direction? And I don't think it actually has anything to do with homosexuality. The homosexuality part of it is a complete different issue. And that, to me, you know, they have their own little thing. And, again, I'll just give you an example why I would have that access. At one time, 
I don't know if you know the terminologies, but the queen of the lesbian community at the time, this was both male and female homosexuals, was getting married. Now, we're only having it legalized now, but in the subculture, the marriages have been taking place forever. And the interesting part of it was she wanted me to walk the bride down the aisle. Now, here I am, a New York City detective, and they've asked me because to them it was an honor that they could trust me and do this. Well, I told her I needed permission from the police department, so I typed up what is known as a 49. You had to get permission to do something like this. And I did that. So can you imagine the response I got when I turned that letter in? I can't use the words that were used to tell me what to do, but uh, I never walked the bride down the aisle. So I think what I'm trying to show here is what extent we, we were in. We were from a truly right, uh, honorable thing to where we saw the degeneracy that was coming in. Well, well, you know, there, there's an issue with that because, you know, uh, I, I criticize the Republicans because they say they're all family values and stuff. But yet, mm -hmm. they 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 also want to reject the fact that they that homosexuals are out there, that they exist, that, that. But you know, you have to remember that every every gay person is somebody's son, somebody's daughter, somebody's brother, sister, whatever you know. And and so <clears throat> they the Republicans pound their chest about family values, yet they reject family members for orientation. So, do do I think it's right? I, I don't have an opinion. It's not for me. So, but I don't. Th but, I don't think these people should be punished, ostracized. I think they should live their life, uh, as they say in, the, in like if you lease an apartment with quiet enjoyment. Allow them yeah. to just go along and get along. Don't bother anybody. Nobody will bother you. But we there. There is this predatory element out there that wants to feed on this and um, <clears throat> take advantage of it. And, and, and it's it's everywhere. I mean, there there there's predators everywhere. And you know, the the older I get, I, I still find myself very naive and gullible. But I, I still come across, occasionally, you'll find these predatory personalities. And it's, uh, you know, boy, what do we do with the, with the predators out there? How should we be treating them? Well, here again, we come into this thing of why aren't there any, why isn't there being anything done about trafficking, you know, and the use of this. Do you know that in 1972, the New York City Police Department, the FBI, the Internal Revenue Service, the police from Minneapolis, Minnesota, Columbus, Ohio, and a couple of other states went after the pimps. All these things are run by pimps. And it is the only time in this country that we went after the 12 biggest pimps in the United States and we convicted 11 of the 12 pimps. To this day, there has never been another high-level uh, pimping operation taken down. Both male and female uh, prostitution, there are pimps. And they are not hard to get, except nobody's going after them. Although I did see lately in Minnesota here, Minneapolis and St. Pa uh, Paul have a couple of police officers who are finally doing a tremendous job. But uh, why aren't we having any investigations done? Again, it gets back to what we were talking about before. Why is nobody ordering this? Well, number one, any police officer who takes on these cases, their careers are over. Maybe be FBI, Customs, Homeland, you go down the line, you take on any of these major cases, your careers are over. Well, that, that brings up another point. You know, uh, you know it, it appears that we've got, you know, I believe that the vast majority of law enforcement and the judiciary are good, honorable people. I think the vast majority of them want to do the right thing, try to do the right thing. But whenever you encounter um, career-threatening issues, that if, you, if by doing the right thing you're going to be fired, you're going to be stuck in some dead-end job, you know how do you? There, there's bottlenecks within everything. They, the, the 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 bad guys don't have to control the whole department. They merely have to control several bottlenecks within the department. Several uh, positions of authority where, where paperwork goes through, where budgets get approved, where these things. And that's where they really focus on putting their people into. Uh, any comment, uh, commentary about that and, and how they manage that? Oh, that's very true. You hit the nail on the head. And uh, uh, you're, you're working like I was. And uh, the first time we got stopped, 
was fine, and then there was another investigation ordered, and the inspector was assigned, and we went into it. We got to a certain point. We were stopped, and finally, the governor of the state of New York, uh, Kerry, appointed myself and my partner, Matthew Rosenthal, to the New York State Select Committee on Crime, and uh, you won't believe it. That we we brought the girl, the female part of it in. We had public hearings, and we presented testimony and all that. And once we got into the pedophile part of it, and we're going to go public with that, is it was shut down. We never found out who shut it down, but it proved to me that there were even powers higher than the governor in the state of New York to shut us down. And I was done. I mean, my career was over. And I knew it. I wasn't stupid. And uh, the next thing is uh, I got retired. Well, that, that, that's really interesting because, you know, we, we've heard about this pedophile slash homosexual mafia out there. Um, you know, and, and there, there's more coming to light about that every day. Um, can you comment on, on that? What, what's been your experience? And, and, you know, who are these people? And, uh how, how high up does this go? Because what I've heard is that this, this goes all the way up to the White House. Oh, definitely. You go back, you brought up Barney Frank. Well, in Barney Frank, there was uh, there's people that involved, go back on that. But let me start from the beginning there. It, it was It's called the uh, Franklin cover-up, where I was given an intelligence report to critique, and then it went to uh, Omaha, Nebraska, to uh, John DeCamp, who was a... a politician, lawyer out there, and it started a big investigation called the Franklin Cover-Up, which took right into the White House. It had uh, uh, Henry Vinson was one of the key people, Greg Spence. Greg Spence was tied directly to Barney Frank and that operation. We had that long before it ever was made public. And Greg Spence ended up dying in Massachusetts. And uh, But it shows how far and how how this thing went. And that investigation started after I retired, but like everything else, you know, people would come to me and I, I critiqued that intelligence report and then it was sent out. And it, it took everything right into it. and It probably exposed the biggest pedophile trafficking operation in the country. And to this day, there's been nothing done. There's never been an investigation. Well, what, 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 what happens to these kids, these, uh, uh, these young boys who are used by these pedophile rings? What happens to them? Well, many of them don't survive or live very long. There's different groups in this. Uh, some of them are killed outright in, their, in, in sexual uh, liaisons. And just to give you an example, uh, I had an informant that had an apartment on East 64th Street in New York, and one night, certain people in our intelligence community were using his apartment to compromise some individuals. And three little boys were murdered. And these boys were, we believe, were buried in Connecticut. But when we started investigating it, we finally confronted the guy that actually was responsible. And again, they invoked national security. And we were stopped. The, the case was stopped. National security was put, was put in. And to this day, I can't figure out what part of the National Security Act allows them to kill kids. And this, you know, we named them and we had everything on it. So it goes into this whole thing, and this is why you can see you get heat when you do these investigations. Okay, well, well Jim, we're coming up to our top of the hour news break. And uh, this is our longer break, so if you need to go get a cup of coffee or a glass of water or something, now's a good time. Just be back in seven minutes, okay? Okay, I'll be here. All right, folks, we'll be right back. Well, good afternoon and welcome back. This is Mike Harris on RentsRadio.com, and today is Wednesday, July 10th, 2013, which, by the way, is the birthday of probably the greatest mind of the 20th century, Nikolai Tesla. And uh, just imagine for a moment what our science and technology would be like if the FBI had not seized the, uh, the, the train loads of, uh, of notes and documentation and stuff on his research. And it, it is still classified. It's still secret. But, but Jim, I want to go back to, to your earlier point here about national security. And you, you look at these people who are in critical positions where they're what I would call a bottleneck position. And 
um, they use national security as an excuse to commit crimes against the American people. Uh, you talk about this a little bit for us. Well, yes, and don't forget, we want to get back to the, uh, what happens to the victims of this. But in this particular thing, if you've got a guy that's in a sensitive position and you compromise him, can you just imagine, and then you cover it up under national security? What part of this, you know, I just don't understand that. To be able to invoke, like, the situation we had. We had victims. We identified the man. We served them with a subpoena for the New York State Select Committee on Crime, and you invoke national security. There is something wrong if we allow this to happen. Don't you agree, or am I mistaken? Well, well, no, there's more than something. There's a whole lot wrong. And one of the cases I want to remind you of, and I'm sure you're well aware of, was Elliot Spitzer was preparing to file some very significant criminal actions against the Wall Street banks. And right as, as he's getting ready for these filings, suddenly the tapes of him being out with this attractive young woman as a prostitute come out and his career is ruined and he, he has to resign as attorney general. I mean, it's, it's, it, they, 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 they put it to him. So he had been compromised, but he wasn't buckling to the pressure and whatever he wouldn't buckle, they broke him. Well, you brought up, I was going to bring that case up. That is a perfect example, but now let's look at the rest of the story. Who was the guy that exposed it? A man named Roger Stone. Guess who Roger Stone was the protege of? Roy Cohen, the famous attorney from the McCarthy hearings and all that, one of the greatest users of this type of information or compromise you have ever met in your life. I'll give you a story on that. Uh, there was a night we got information at a United States center, senator, one of the high-ranking senators of our country, was at a pedophile bar in New York so we go there. It was an upscale restaurant, too. And me and my partner walked in. And I, my partner took a shrimp off his plate and started eating it. And the senator got very indignant about it and got the house phone. And who does he call but Roy Cohen? And he's telling Roy Cohen about these two cops, you know, and wow, he's just ranting and raving. All of a sudden, the tone goes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. And he's looking at us. And he hangs up the phone and he says, I'd like to apologize if I acted harshly to you. Would you like to sit and join me for dinner? We were sent there. We knew this man. He had no idea that he had been compromised. And he was a very powerful man. But the point is, Roy Cohen was the guy. I interviewed Roy Cohen personally in his apartment one night. And we discussed this. He knew I couldn't do nothing to him. And I knew that he couldn't do nothing to me because we knew each other. And that's where Roger Stone came out of. So isn't it a coincidence that a guy like Stone would be involved in that? Well, it is, this is not a coincidence to me at all. Actually, it, it's, it sort of sounds like it, make, it makes perfect sense. But let us talk a little bit more about Roy Cohen because he's a, a pretty dark figure in, in the U.S. And, and had what I consider to be a... Uh, a very negative uh, effect on, on how this country has evolved since he became involved in, in the process. And we also Why want to certainly. talk about the church in the process as well. We're going to get to that in a minute. Well, certainly Roy Cohen, his, so, and the night I interviewed him, and Roy said, you know, my job was if one of our people got caught, it was my job to take care of it. And if it needed somebody compromised, that was my job. So Roy operated at the very highest levels, both in the government, in business, and another interesting place called the United Nations in our diplomatic thing. And this is where the real power was. And uh, like I said, I personally talked to Roy. And the other thing is, after he died, from the information we had when those three little boys were killed on East 64th Street, we believed I had retired by the time but we always believed that those bodies were buried on his farm in Greenwich, Connecticut. So Roy was very deeply, and I questioned him about the three boys. He didn't. He knew about it. He didn't deny knowing about it, but he wouldn't comment on it. So Roy was tremendously powerful, but the interesting is, at the end, they took him down. They compromised him because that way he had no credibility. That's another thing you're going to find in this. You look at all these cases. 
all these people end up being put in prison for at least a year and a day to be compromised so technically they have no credibility. And I can give you a litany of those types of people. Well, you know, I, I keep coming back to the same point is how do we fix this? How do we root out this vermin that has infested this cancer that, that is destroying our, our, the fabric of our culture, the, uh, you know, the, the, the integrity of our nation? How do we root them out? How do we get rid of this problem? What, you know, well, what do we have to do? Do we, I mean, do we have to go extrajudicial once we know who these guys are and just, uh, you know, that's what they do to us? Well, yes, but, you know, again, with all these things, we have, you know, put out together plans and, and different things that can be done. But there was an interesting thing. I told you about the 12 pimps we took down. Right after that happened, we had a president by the name of Richard Nixon. And Richard Nixon decided that this was a real problem. And tie this in with what happened to him. Richard Nixon, and I was asked to take the position, was going to set up a special unit. He knew what this was all about. And Nixon set up a special unit working in his office where there were going to be uh, five New York City detectives and certain police officers from around the country, handpicked by myself, and there were going to be some federal agents involved. And we would only answer to the President of the United States. Well, it never happened. Watergate happened. So this was one way that this could be done. It has to be done at a level, like all our investigations. 99% of the information we had could not be written down because if somebody got it, it would have been devastating. They would have used it to extort people and this type of thing. So it's a uh, very, uh, what would you call it, secret oh, well, I, 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 I'd call it like, like Elliot Ness and the Untouchables, except instead of going after yes. bootleggers, you're, you're going after pedophiles and, and yes. other human traffickers. Well. Just think of the information. It got so bad, we put it in the police department files. This was very early on. And if somebody, you know, all of a sudden our files would disappear. And then we go check at the victims, and we found out they were being extorted and different types of things. So somebody got to our files. So that's when we stopped that. But the other thing, if uh, I had put, <clears throat> and there's been times after Nixon, had, back in 92, 93, Charlie Rose, a congressman from North Carolina, had me come down to Washington, and I had re prepared a report, and there were going to be bipartisan congressional investigations into this. But after I presented my report and gave my uh, information on it, nothing ever happened. He never ran for office, and any of the other people that were there and involved never ran again. The only one that did was Barbara Mikulski out of Maryland. But I had done a report and presented that. And with that, there, if there's a couple of laws that they pass, would would definitely stop this right in its tracks. And it's only it only is five laws, and you could you could cut this down 95 percent. But you'd have to have cops who you know would be protected. Well, um, why don't we why don't we switch gears for a minute and talk about the church of the process? Because I, I've been prompted by uh, a mutual friend to, to get you to discuss that a little bit. So why don't you tell the listeners what that is and what what it means to them out there right after this short break. We'll be right back. More with Detective Jim Rothstein. Be right back, folks. Well, good afternoon. Welcome back. This is Mike Harris on RinseRadio.com. Today is Wednesday, July 10th, 2013. My guest today is retired NYPD detective Jim Rothstein. Jim, welcome back. And Thank before you the for break, having me back. Oh, it's my pleasure. It really is. I'm, I'm glad to get you on. And you know, my, my, my question before the break was, tell the listeners about the Church of the Process and, and, and what that's all about, what their goals are, who they are, and, and what, what they're doing to people out there. Well, now you're really opening a can of worms. As I told you, when we started investigating this, we got into many different facets of trafficking. And at one point, 1969, 1970, I received information from one of my very reliable sources. Uh, he took me to Untermeyer Park in Yonkers, New York, which is just above the Bronx in New York City. 
And we went to Untermeyer Park, and he takes me into the park, and I never forget, because years later I'd be brought back there, but we went down, and he showed me the location where they were sacrificing German shepherds and children. And at the time, with that information, who the heck would ever believe this? But because we were dealing in this world, weird stuff, we put it in, the, in our file, you know, in our mental file, and started working on it. Uh, we had made some arrests when people involved in this uh, were using kids. Uh, some of them were high, you know, very well-known people. One night we got a chauffeur for one of the big people and uh, uh, picking up some kids. But what was interesting is as this case evolved, uh, a thing came up that ended up being called the Son of Sam case. I don't know if you're familiar with that, Mike. But oh, yeah, that, that, that's where they this, uh, what was named Berkowitz, I guess, was walking around yeah. New York City and David shooting Berkowitz. people with a, uh, a short-barreled forty four Magnum at close range. Yes, but that's what the story says, but that's the furthest thing from the truth you ever heard. Like I said, we were on this long before he was caught, I believe it was 1978. I had already been working on that for eight years. And the information we were getting was so wild, who'd believe it? But we've talked to many people in it, and eventually we became aware of an organized operation here in this particular part of human trafficking, which had more to do with satanic rituals and that type of thing. And just incidentally, I at one time had debriefed a high priestess uh, in the satanic and the uh, type of thing. So which was something nobody else had, but we're working this, and eventually I'm informed by a detective. Like I say, when it was weird, they'd call me, and I knew the guy quite well, and it was nothing official because you couldn't do it, and that's what alerted that there was a serial killer going in New York, and eventually they arrested David Berkowitz, but I still didn't know the whole story till. <clears throat> I met up with a man named Maury Terry who wrote the book, The Ultimate Evil. And Maury had done a lot of work on Berkowitz and, in fact, got to know Berkowitz. Now, we knew there was something going. We knew that it had a real weird religious connection. And we knew it came to the United States in about 65, which ended up being the process. They had been in New Orleans, and then they got up to New York. And when just prior to the Berkowitz case being exposed, uh, there were some weird things that happened. Certain elements of this group started moving west along Interstate 9094. When Berkowitz got arrested, he was charged with eight murders. Well, it turns out Berkowitz only killed two. The other six people were killed by two people from Minnesota. And... Back in 92 or 97, I was brought back to New York by the Yonkers Police Department when an investigation was reopened into the Son of Sam case. And that's when I went back and I confronted my informant and all that. <clears throat> and by that time, we had found out the rest of the story about the process. And this process moved across country. Uh, the last man killed that we knew of was in Minot, North Dakota, and uh, that was one of the car boys. But it was a much deeper case in the New York Police Department. When I went back for the, in 97, I believe it was, the detective from the NYPD, when a certain <clears throat> official in the police department found out I was there, they were not happy, and they took the detective out of it and, and shut the case down. And the process is just unbelievable of what they were involved with in this type of stuff. And that's why, again, getting back, what happens to the victim? Well, these there were, as you know, people were shot, kids were killed, shepherd, German shepherds. So it's a, it's a long-going story. Well, tell us more. More about who, who were these people? What, what was their goal? Where did they come from? You said they, they came here in uh, the late 60s, early 70s, and migrated west. Uh, have, have, have you lost track of them? Are they still? Oh, no, no. The they ended up in, uh, no. No, they ended up in Kanab, Utah. 
the last I heard. <coughs> but they came from England, and it was a guy, uh, a woman by the name of the Grimson, who were the leaders of it, the quasi-leaders. And, uh, oh, they had a lot of people, a lot of wealthy people were involved, but Berkowitz took the rap for everybody. Gotcha, okay. So we'll be right back. We're after a short break. More with uh, Detective Gemma Rothstein. Be right back, folks. Stick with us. Today is retired NYPD Detective Jim Rothstein. Jim, welcome back. And, Thank you, Mike. Yeah, I'm going I'm to switch gears on you a little bit here. Uh, before you do... Before you do, Mike, there's the rest of the story on the Okay, well, well please, please finish up. Okay. Uh, it sort of be, seemed the case was pretty closed, and, but then all of a sudden another New York detective starts investigating a murder in New York and follows it along Interstate 9094, and it became known as the Smiley Face Killer. There were 22 kids killed. Uh, these were all younger, 21, 22-year-old college students who would end up dying in the water and stuff, and there'd be a smiley face at the location. That was another thing that was tied to this. It followed right along through Ohio, you know, to Minnesota, out to Dakotas. And here's another thing. Jeffrey Dahmer, again, 94, Milwaukee, was involved. We know one of the 44s used in these murders came from Eau Claire, Wisconsin. Father Kunz from Wisconsin was murdered when he started looking at a faction of this. So you can see it didn't just stop with the Son of Sam case. It had moved west as we had seen it start doing. So that is, you know, how this thing went. Now, I ha there has been, since Gannon went public with this, there have been no more murders of this type. So I don't know if there's another group going. I haven't heard about it. Well, you know, you, you provoke a question in my mind. And one thing, I, whenever I turn on the, the idiot box, and I, I don't watch it very much, but every time I do, 90% of the TV shows seem to be about serial killers. And uh, that they seem, you know, Hollywood seems to be fascinated with these. And, and what, what sort of a psyop is Hollywood pulling on us trying to get this to be a regular part of, of American entertainment and uh, on American people's mind by watching this trash on TV. Well, yes, it's all part of that program I described, what I call the 50-year plan. Uh, and, again, don't forget Manson and them all came out of this operation, too. So it's spread across the country. But serial killers, you know, in every one of these cases, when you look, police do have information, but they don't know what they have. And I'll tell you another interesting thing. Mike, right now in the United States, there's only four law enforcement agents that I know who are willing to listen to the information we have, and they are not in any government agency. These are local uh, city police from around the country, four right now, four. So whenever we watch Criminal Minds and we see this special uh, FBI unit that flies around the country on their Gulfstream uh, jet, uh, that that's just hokum. That, that there's no such thing. That these uh, there's nobody really investigates this stuff. Well, yes, they they are doing it, and I I applaud them for the level. But they're going after the lot lizards and you know the girls in the truck stops and the low echelon stuff. But to go after the real high level stuff, no. And there are some things that I can't say on the air that verify this, and it gets back to it. Uh, why would an FBI agent give up his career to go after something like this? You can well, go after the little guys. No problem. You can go after the well, but street be, level. Be because stuff. it's the right thing to do? I mean, be, because be, really that, that's the answer. That, that's why you should, because it's the right thing to do. And you know, yes, we all have a moral very, compass. We all have yeah. a moral compass, and if, if we've got uh, law enforcement officers within any agency, whether it's you know your local uh, town's PD or the county sheriff or the, the state uh, police force or, or the FBI or any of the national organizations, national agencies, you go after this stuff because it's the right thing to do, and it's damn the torpedoes full speed ahead. I'm going to bring these uh, these people to justice no matter what it takes, and and really that's the attitude that we need in dealing with this type of vermin. That's, that's, a, that's a polite word I'll use. 
Yes, it is, and they should be made to do it, and that's why we need laws to be put in there that would make sure this would happen, but it gets back to it, then we got to protect the police officer. And, you know, that is a, a, a tough thing to do. Yeah, it, it is. It, it really is, particularly whenever you have such pervasive organized crime. I look at what our, our current Department of Justice does, and, and you know, quite frankly, as, as an American citizen, I have grave reservations about the ability of our, our current AG to to fulfill his constitutional mandate. I, I, I don't think he's doing it. In fact, I, I think that he is in violation of his oath of office, but that, that's, that's, an, that's another whole uh, radio show on that yeah. one. Yes, and right. here's the other thing. There was a, there is another solution to this. And when we got stopped with the New York State Select Committee on Crime, when we were doing that investigation, we had brought in the Policy Science Corporation, which was headed by a man named Harold Laswell. He had been a Freudian scientist, uh, you know, uh, working human uh, behavior and stuff like that. So. I never forget we were up there one night in his apartment overlooking the Hudson River, and I said to him, I said, Harold, now we've been stopped even after the governor put on this. What do I have to do to bring a case that it will go through? He said, Jim, there's only one way you can do this. You've got to get the mothers to unite and back you and make the men do what they're supposed to do to protect their children. He says, you get the mothers behind you. And you know what? I never had thought about that. And if I would have had that in my day, and that's why to this day, you give me the mothers. And there is one mother that I have that has stood up in all the cases I've worked up is a woman by the name of Noreen Gosh in West Des Moines, Iowa. Her son was kidnapped in 1982, and it's been a cover-up from day one. But she is the only mother that has stood up against all agencies, all governments, and fought this. But if I could come up with 25,000, 155 mothers to stand up, this can be accomplished. Any law enforcement agent that would have that behind them would be able to do his job. Nobody can go against the mothers. Well, I'll tell you, I liked your earlier suggestion that if I was ever elected president of the United States, I would recruit the the very toughest, most honest uh, law enforcement officers from across the country and uh, turn them loose on this pedophile ring, and we would bring them down. We would we would we would run them to ground. They 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 would be happy to be in prison after what we'll do to them. So, but uh, that that's just a personal opinion there. But uh, well, I, I go ahead. Yes, that is true. And the thing is, there are cops that would do that, federal agents. I know them personally. If they knew they could do their job, they would do it. But right now we've got an obstacle that, that prevents them from doing their job. And that, folks, that, that's what I'm talking to the listeners. That, dear listeners, that is what we have to go after. We have to remove these obstacles within our within our own uh, institutions, whether it's uh, law enforcement, the judiciary, uh, any other parts of government, uh, with, within business, banking, anything that enables this to go on, we have to stop it. We have to remove the obstacles. We let to ha- need to have law enforcement doing what they're supposed to do instead of becoming this martial law police state. You're right, 100%. Okay, now, now can I switch gears on you? Sure, I'm ready to go. Okay, now, since you've retired uh, as a New York City police detective, you've been uh, retained as a, a researcher, a private researcher for various wealthy individuals and perhaps families. Now, I've been led to believe, and I'll hold my question till after this break. I'm saved by the bell, but right after this break, I'm going to ask you this, this question. So uh, stick with us, folks. Before the break, we, I, I ask, I'm beginning to ask you a question that uh, that after you retired, you became a private researcher for your various wealthy individuals, families, etc. And you've been asked to look into what I will call um, esoteric issues, namely where, where I'm getting to is this UFO thing, 
and about uh, the secret government programs that, that are withholding technologies, you know, uh, like the Tesla technology, for example, since it's his birthday, and, and other, you know, energy technologies and stuff like that. What, what can you tell us about this? How real is this? What does the government know that they're not telling us? What have, your, what have you found out uh, in your own investigations? Well, let me tell you how that particular one you're referring to, which was one of a number of them, but there was an individual in Chicago a uh, quite wealthy man who I was contacted by that wanted to know the truth about a man named Michael Riconosciuto. Michael Riconosciuto had been also tied to Inslaw, which was the software by Bill and Nancy Hamilton that was stolen. And uh, Riconosciuto... You're, 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 you're talking about the Promise software, right? Yes, yes. And he asked me to go find out what the truth was in what Riconor Shudo was talking about. See, the only way I will do anything is it can't have an agenda, and it is only for the truth. The truth cannot be, you know, pointed in a certain direction. It has to be what it is. So the very first thing I did, I was brought to Chicago, and Michael Riconor Shudo was there to testify in front of the Bua Grand Jury. And I interviewed him on three occasions while he was being held for the Grand Jury which sent me off on an investigation that was the most astounding thing that I have ever done or heard of. Although I must say that in my work as a detective, when we were working uh, the pedophile stuff and the prostitution, we had heard about some of these things and some of these hidden programs that were being conducted and that. But this particular case sent me out to Yuma, Arizona. <coughs> and I verified many of the things that Ricardo Shudo said. And among that, the one thing that you are talking about is some of the programs that had to do with technology that I believe came from Tesla. Uh, it had to do with magnetic energy, uh, anti-gravity stuff. And one of the things that I was sent to verify is the fact that Ricardo Shudo had described some of these events that were happening because he had worked out of the Cabazon Indian Reservation and they would use the proving grounds to test their equipment. So you're, you're, talking, I, about, you're talking about the, the, the U.S. military's Yuma proving ground out there, right? Because I've yes, been there several yes, times. So. Yes. You know, everybody looks at Area 51. That's the wrong place to look. Once the whistle was blown on that, all they had to do was to go south a little bit and the Yuma proving grounds and Nobody ever pays attention to it. Well, <clears throat> I went down there <clears throat> and verified much of the information that Reconosciuto had given as being factual. Uh, it started off with being able to verify that him and a couple other people had taken a Stinger missile from Cabazon Inner uh, Reservation and taken it to Yuma to test it. That was the first one we had to verify to give him any credibility at all. Then my, he had given me information about <clears throat> a portion of the proving grounds that was used for what we call the U, uh, extraterrestrial or whatever you want to call it. Now, one thing he always made sure to tell me, don't call them UFOs because that's not, you know, aliens and all that. He says there's technology out there. It had been written about Boylan, wrote about it. It's part of the Aurora Project. And we were able to verify that some of this technology was being used. And if you go back to Iraq in Fallujah, you remember that little incident in Fallujah where they had the, <clears throat> said they gave 30 days to get out of there before they'd raid them? And then yes, all I of do. a sudden, and then all of a sudden the word was that Allah was mad at him because he came out of the skies and these bolts of lightning, as they were described, would destroy him. Now, what is so, you know, this sort of verifies that it, this does exist. But the information that I went out there with was 100% accurate. Everything that Reconosciuto had given me was verified. And that's how, and, you know, with this, uh, if you look at the Aurora Project, it's an interesting project. 
Well, it is. And, and why don't you explain a little bit about that? Because I've, I've got some insight on it, but I, you're the guest. I'd rather hear it from you. Well, like I said, well, I'm not into that business. So I have not, I'm not a scientist. I know nothing about it. It's just that I know that these things are supposed to be anti-gravity and uh, that they are, uh, you know, use some type of a propulsion magnetic or whatever it may be. All I know is these things, uh, as it was described to me, the desert would open up and these objects would come out and poof, they were gone. You know, they would just leave at tremendous speed. You, there was no noise, no nothing. They were just gone. And this was described to by the, you know, like I say, I I was there to check it out, and I know how to do that stuff. But this is what was described to me. How it works, I have no clue. But Reconnaissance did know. And then where's he at today? Uh... He's doing the remaining four years of a 25-year prison sentence for manufacturing drugs, which was a totally trumped-up charge. Like I said, when you're a guy like that, you always end up in prison to discredit you. You know, uh, I, this, you know Jim, we're just scratch. I sense we're just scratching the tip of the iceberg here. I, I think we've oh, yes. got stories that can go on and on and on. And and I, yeah. I'd like to invite you back sometime in the future be, because, uh, like sure. I said, this is really an introductory um, interview here, having you on for the first time. But you've got so much knowledge about these things. I mean, I, I want to ask you about Vince Foster as well. But, I, you know, all this stuff, because I, I know you've got an insight there. Well, I certainly, again, the Vince Foster and all that stuff, uh, I, you know, there's a book written on it. You know, all of these things are not hidden, but you just got to know. It's a book called Compromise, written by a guy named, uh, uh, what's his name again? Uh, uh, John Cummings and Terry Reed. And the whole Vince Foster case is so much more to it. And... Uh, I did some work on that and was able to verify it. I interviewed people who were directly involved in it and uh, uh, many other things that let you know that there was more to the Vince Foster story that ever came out. So why did they murder him? Well, you got to remember, you got to start with Mena, Arkansas, and that's what this book, Compromise, is written about. Okay. Uh, Mena, okay. Arkansas. Huh? So, oh, okay. Uh, I'll find the book. Yeah. But Mena, Arkansas was a place where uh, drug money was laundered through. And it had to do with Terry Reed, who was a pilot, and uh, it involved some of the biggest drug operations, uh, Barry Seal and that operation and with the South American cocaine operations. So, uh, you know, all these things, you've got to look at the whole story before you can make a decision on what happened and why. And most of it is not a big conspiracy. It's like the Kennedy thing. Everybody wants to make that a big conspiracy. It's not. And, you know, I look at the basics. It's the economics of it. And there are rules. I call them the rules of 8th Avenue. If you violate those rules, you die. And if I'm doing an investigation and somebody violated those rules, it's not hard to figure out what the story is. And that's why uh, that whole... Vince Foster case is far more than anybody expects. Well, we, we've only got a couple minutes left, so you know, as the guest, I'd like to invite you to uh, to go ahead. What do you want to leave the uh, the listeners with? What What do you want their takeaway to be today from uh, from this time that that we spent together on the radio here? Very simple. Any mother or any father or any relative who has a victim of this, don't take it sitting down. Do not believe what you're being told. Uh, we have a whole thing put together, myself and Noreen Gosh, on what to do if you do have a victim in your family. And then get a cop to do his job and back him. The poor guy will be crucified if he goes after any of these cases in an in-depth investigation. So you can see with all the cases we've got lately, those three little girls from Cleveland, uh, that type of thing, that's, that's abduction. And that all comes under slavery and that type of thing. So, again, give give the cops a chance, but you got to protect them. And if they don't do their job, go after them. I mean, don't well, let them tell you, 
we can't talk about this case. Well, well my, my, my closing question is, is why do so many agencies, I'm not saying the, the, the actual officers themselves, but why do so many agencies seem to enable and encourage cover-ups of this stuff? What's the, who's got the secret sauce behind that? What, what's going on there? It's called human compromise. You've got the right guy compromised. We've gone over many of these cases. And if I've got the right guy, but you know what, he'll do what I want him to do. And that's what happens in many of these things. Powers from outside stop it. And I would say that happens in every case. Well, there you have it, folks. Uh, Detective Jim Ross and Jim, thank you very much. We're out of time today. As I stated earlier, I do want to invite you back. Uh, let me contact you in a few weeks again, and we'll get something else scheduled, okay? Okay, thank you, Mike. Well, thank you, Jim. And listeners, I'll be back tomorrow. Um, I'll have another interesting guest. Talk to you then. Bye-bye.